Enjoy historical stories on the History Fix platform. Explore movies, short films, and documentaries. Addressing Gettysburg podcast fans receive an extra $5 off the first year's annual subscription. Sign up at HistoryFix.com and use promo code Gettysburg. Every subscription includes a seven-day risk-free trial. Escape into history with History Fix. Want the freshest cup of coffee in Gettysburg? Then visit Bantam Roasters, formerly 82 Cafe at 82 Steinware Avenue. They roast all of their coffee in-house, and they have a full coffee bar to keep you caffeinated during your trip. Visit them at www.raggededgerc.com for their menu and shipping options for all of their freshly roasted coffee. Use promo code HANCOCK for 10% off your order in the cafe. The 1863 civilians of Gettysburg were reluctant witnesses to the great battle. Join Ken Rich, the man in the red shirt, for his historic town walking tours. You could book these tours by emailing ken at gettysburgtownhistory.com. That's ken at gettysburgtownhistory.com. And when you're in town, look for the guy in the red shirt. This episode of Addressing Gettysburg is brought to you in part by me, audiobook narrator Mike Scott. Narrator of Savas Beatty's Bloody Autumn, the Shenandoah Valley Campaign of 1864, and unlike anything that ever floated, the Monitor and Virginia and the Battle of Hampton Roads. If you are an author or publisher interested in having your titles produced as audiobooks, or even just in learning more about the process, give me a shout. You can find my contact info on my website, mikescottvoice.com. That's mikescottvoice.com. And Civil War Trails. It's the world's largest open-air museum, and they offer over 1,300 sites across six states. Drive the Gettysburg Campaign turn-by-turn, turn, paddle to Frederick Douglass's birthplace, or hike to remote earthworks and artillery positions. Visit CivilWarTrails.org to request a brochure and explore their interactive map. Follow Civil War Trails and create some history of your own. All free episodes of Addressing Gettysburg are brought to you by our sponsors and our patrons over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. To become a sponsor, send an email to matt at addressing Gettysburg.com. And to be a patron, go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg today. And we thank you in advance. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. There's a light out up here. That, that light's out. The, the, bar, the overhead bar lights are out. The fan? Under the fan, yeah, that yeah. light, that yeah. light's normal. Yeah. Sometimes he doesn't like to turn his on during the day. Oh. Um, I know Matt doesn't have his food yet, but I'm going to start, okay? Okay. Well, he got his appetizer. Okay. Well, I just, you know, they, they come out in the middle. And, okay. Unless they were getting ready to come, I guess that's what no, I was saying. No, it's going to be. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, we'll get started. Okay, I guess we're ready to start. So I want to thank everybody for attending the last Sunday evening winter lecture of this season. You know, we, we probably, over in the past years, and, you know, we, we continue on, but we get really busy in here on Sunday nights uh, starting in March. And so it just doesn't uh, make any sense to uh, do a program up here in the tavern and kick the tourists out. <laughs> we need the tourists. So, um, uh, oh, you don't need us. No. <laughs> <laughs> but we do need you in December and January. You see how that works? And, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting living, uh, you know, next to the Farnsworth House for so long and... And, uh, you know, even before I lived here, I lived next to here. And uh, seeing the, the, the local business's um, relationship with locals in the winter and then in the spring is always interesting. Because, you know, if you're a local business, you need locals to come in during the winter to make it through the winter. But you really don't need them in the spring and the summer. <laughs> So there is, there's always that going on, uh, the, uh, that uh, the dynamic. Let's go to dynamic. But um, uh, I want to thank everybody who's attended the programs uh, this past winter. Um, I, I thought that tonight I'd do something uh, on um, civilian casualties. Basically, you know, what I, what I do in these programs is I look at the book I wrote on the Gettysburg civilians about 10 years ago that I've never published and I just pull chapters out of the book. 
And this is a topic that I'm really interested in, is the civilians of Gettysburg and the surrounding area in the battlefield who were uh, killed or wounded or captured or missing after the battle. And uh, uh, tonight, this program is being uh, recorded for the Addressing Gettysburg podcast. So if you want to listen to it again, you can always uh, look for it on the, the podcast. Um, and this is a good program uh, to listen to because tonight you might notice I, I don't have any slides. I don't have my slide screen here uh, for the um, uh, people to look at. So you're, they're not missing any images. I do have some images of the people that I'm talking about tonight, uh, but not, uh, I guess I don't have as many to make it uh, worthwhile to put into a PowerPoint program. So um, to give you an introduction, you know, many visitors and Civil War enthusiasts are aware of the fact that the Union and Confederate Army suffered uh, some 51,000 casualties in the Battle of Gettysburg. But when speaking of the civilians, most people are aware of only one fatality, Mary Virginia Wade. And although Jenny Wade was the only citizen of the town to be killed during the actual fighting. The word casualty refers to those who were killed, wounded, captured, missing, or died as a result of the battle. And depending on how you figure, some 20 citizens fit into this category and possibly over 30 or higher, depending on how you count. This is if you were to add the number of citizens who were injured in the battle in related accidents and those who've died of disease caused by the unhealthy conditions in town after the battle. So I think I, I counted, and it's funny, I did this count like an hour ago. How many do I have on my list do I want to count in this total? And so I have 29. So, and that's not counting people who died from the contaminated wells after the battle. I'm sure uh, I have at least three people who definitely uh, died because their wells were bad because of the disease after the battle. Um, that I can directly attribute to that, and probably about 10 if I were to um, look harder. But you know, you have to find some kind of documentation to support your conclusion. Also, uh, in my total 29, I didn't count the dog I'm gonna talk about. So, we have a dog. So according to Webster's Dictionary, a casualty can be a military person lost through death, wounds, injury, sickness, internment, or capture, or those being missing in action. Another definition is a person or a thing injured, lost, or destroyed. And I looked around at some current meanings and definitions of the word because I am unaware of anywhere, any place where a casualty is a death. It can be a death, but for some reason, people think that the word casualty means death. And what's really interesting about that is the misunderstanding of the word has led to repeated um, misinformation in books and documentaries about the Battle of Gettysburg. And uh, two examples, probably they're, they're bad examples, but two examples are the movie, since we're watching the movie Gettysburg up there earlier, there's a documentary associated with the movie Gettysburg on the disc. Has anybody watched the documentary associated with the movie? And in the very beginning, the first thing they say is, 
There were 51,000 men killed at the battle. And if you read, um, if you read the booklet, the one with the, photo, the drawings by um, uh, Mort Kunstler, in that he has, in the introduction, Martin Sheen wrote it, and they say 51,000 people were killed in the battle. And it is a common misconception that people spread that 51,000 men were killed at the battle. What I'd really like to ask these people, and, I, and, and when I say that, I should tell you that I have asked them. If people think 51,000 people were killed in the battle, how many other people were wounded in the battle? Since we only have 150,000 soldiers or so. So 51,000 people are not killed in the battle. 51,000 people are killed or wounded or captured or missing. I, I thought about this a lot much more than I probably should have. And I think part of the problem is one of apples and oranges. Today, if we study a modern conflict or we hear about deaths in Afghanistan or Iraq, we're only given the total fatalities. Never did they tell you how many men were wounded. It's always how many men died. I don't know when this started, but I would suspect that this started uh, around Vietnam. I don't know, maybe, I don't know exactly how it was reported in Korea. But in Vietnam, we were only given, you know, the, uh, the news or the general public, how many men died. They didn't tell you about the wounded. So when you talk about the Battle of Gettysburg and you get 51,000 casualties, but if you talk about a modern war like Iraq, you might be given like, 4,000, but that's just dead. In the Civil War, they never give you the dead total. And most likely it's because they don't know. Because <laughs> it's, not, it's not really tracked that well. But having said all that, let me give you some interesting facts and figures. In the end of the official reports, in um, the uh, the booklet that has the Gettysburg official reports, there's a roster of the units, uh, Union and Confederate in uh, different places. And at the end of the rosters, they give you the casualty figures. And they call it a recapitulation. And according to the official reports, the Union Army had 3,155 men killed at the battle. They had 14,529 wounded and captured or missing was 5,365 for a total of 23,049 casualties for the Union Army. And that is still the figure that people use today. So for your knowledge, that figure comes from the printed version of the official reports in the 1880s, and it's a recapitulation of the uh, um, how do they say it, do the casualties that were reported nominally by the regiments uh, that are included in the order of battle in that official report. The Confederate casualties in the official reports are actually given at a much lower figure than we currently use uh, on a general basis. According to the official reports, the Confederate Army only had 2,592 men killed at the battle. 12,700 wounded, uh, 5,150 captured or missing for a total of about 20,451. So the total killed in battle of Gettysburg in official reports, which mostly were tallied in a couple months after the battle, are 5,747. But over the years, the Confederate casualties have been readjusted, whereas the Union casualties are pretty much still given the way they were in the official reports. And the new Confederate figures are the newer, because they're not new, but the newer Confederate figures are um, 3,903 killed, 18,735 wounded, and 5,425 captured or missing. Now, in the Southern casualty figures, there's a description, a disclaimer, that the Southerners did not report um, 
men who were slightly wounded. And if you ever listen to Wayne Motts talk about Pickett's Charge and the casualty figures associated with Pickett's Charge, that's a lot of shrimp. <laughs> that's a lot of shrimp. If you ever uh, listen to Wayne Motts, and I'm sure some of you listen to Wayne Motts a lot, he's really done a good job with this. What does slightly wounded in the Confederate Army mean? If you didn't go to the hospital, you know, you're not wounded. If you got a finger shot off and you just bandage it up yourself, you're not counted as wounded. So the Confederate casualty figures are low. And then I also wanted to point out this. Um, a lot of people were reported as missing. A lot of people. In um, the Southern Army captured or missing or over 5,000. In the Union Army captured or missing or over, so over, um, let's say around 11,000 men are listed as captured or missing. Okay, capture guys that show up in prison camps. Missing, who knows who missing are. But a lot of the missing are killed and buried in unknown graves, but they don't make the killed list. So here's what I'm gonna tell you. Total killed at the Battle of Gettysburg is presumed to be about 7,058. Or let's just say 7,000 men were killed in the battle or died of their wounds. Now, if you died, I think if you die like in Camp Letterman here in Gettysburg, like three or four months later, you're kind of counted as you died in the battle. But if you die in the hospital in Harrisburg a couple weeks after the battle, you're probably not counted as being killed in the battle. You died of your wounds later. So let's add some of those guys together that are missing, that are probably killed, and some of the guys who um, died in other hospitals in Baltimore, Philadelphia, Washington, uh, you know, within a decent time. I think you have to die within like four months of the battle for us to count you. It is tough, isn't it? Because a lot of guys die the day after, or two days after, or a week later, and you want to count them. So anyway, what I'm going to suggest is there's about 10,000 men killed at the battle or died as a result of the battle. And that according to the official reports, and the re I should say the readjusted official reports, the total number of casualties is 51,112. And a lot of people say 51,000 men. But you know, if we're going to approximate from 51,112 to 51,000, on my tours of the battlefield, the eighth graders hear that there are 50,000 casualties. I'm going to approximate to 50,000. Isn't that a little simpler? Okay. Now, I'd really like to see just a book written on this subject and get some actual totals. You know, a real in-depth examination of every regiment and their actual losses and try to figure it out. But, you know, that's a really, really, really difficult thing to do. And again, you know, if you read uh, Busey and Martin's strengths and losses for the battle, they decided not to count the 6th United States Cavalry, because they're at the Battle of Fairfield on July 3rd, and Fairfield is not the Battle of Gettysburg. So it becomes generic as to what you actually count and what you don't count. And there is a nice star next to the casualty figures in the Union official reports that say, this does count soldiers that were wounded in skirmishes near Gettysburg. So, you know, you, you're never going to be exact. Okay. So, This thing I was talking about, um, I think with the Vietnam, it gets out of control. And especially when we watch documentaries on, on TV where they're just looking for quick facts and figures. And here's the statement that I've heard countless times that just, I don't know how to put it, infuriates me. <laughs> it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like, um, uh, when somebody badmouths Jenny Wade in front of me. Okay. Here, and here's a statement from one of the uh, documentaries. More Americans died in the three days at Gettysburg than during the entire Vietnam War. 
Have you heard this from, have you heard somebody say this? Okay, well I want to say it's not a joke. I've heard it hundreds of times on the battlefield. And one of the places that I, that, um, um, I hear, hear it is on Little Round Top. I don't know why, but you know, you get out of the car, I'm giving a tour, people walk up, you know, they walk by me. Um, I heard a school teacher telling the students that one time on Little Round Top, I remember. Um, and I should say this, although I don't recommend this, I've actually stopped my tour and walked over to the people and corrected them. <laughs> I don't do that as much as I used to. It didn't, it never seemed to go very well. I don't, I don't think, I don't think by doing that, I don't think you're making your proper point. You're just, yeah, you're just, I'm an asshole. So. Have you ever stopped in, uh, have you ever stopped somebody to, to tell them that, that they were wrong? Okay, it's not worth it. You're, you're right, it's not worth it. Okay, but I, I just wanted to get this across it. This is a staple of some of the people's tours of the battle that are not, you know, well versed in it. Okay, so let me just, and I'm gonna get into the civilian casualties in a second, I promise. But no matter how you break it down, it's, the comparison is just incorrect. It is also very misleading, and I believe disrespectful to the veterans of the Vietnam War. American casualties in Vietnam, um, what did I say here? Okay, American, oh I'm sorry, I'm kidding, I'm reading my writing. American fatalities in Vietnam are just over 58,000. So if we accept the numbers, 58,000, the statement is blatantly correct because I don't know what kind of math these people took, but 58,000 is not less than 51,000. And we're actually only talking about 10,000 men that died at Gettysburg, so 10,000 is definitely not 58,000. So I guess you could say, you know, you could use total casualties at Gettysburg, and you could say something like, more Americans became casualties at the Battle of Gettysburg than fatalities in the Vietnam War. But then still, uh, again, we're talking about 51 and 58,000, it doesn't seem to work. And you know what? Total American casualties in Vietnam is over 200,000. You, again, you can't compare apples and oranges. If you're going to compare, um, if you're going to compare deaths at Gettysburg, compare deaths in Vietnam. If you're going to compare, you know, wounded, you got you got to do the same thing. I, and I think, you know, it's worth noting that when we talk about the American Civil War, we talk about casualties. One of the reasons they're so much bloodier than other American conflicts is we count the enemy as Americans. I'm not suggesting this is wrong. I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't count the Southerners as American casualties. But when we talk about other battles and other wars, I just want to mention if we compare Gettysburg to D-Day, we don't count the Germans that were killed on D-Day. If we count you know, Vietnam War, not we're going to count the Vietnamese that were killed in these battles against the American soldiers. So these are just some things to think about. Okay. You're thinking. I just want you to think. Okay. So, so here's the thing. Again, with the military, with the soldiers in the battle, we're counting killed, wounded, captured or missing as casualties. But with the civilians, we only count Jenny Wade. Why do we do that? If we're going to count the soldiers the way we do, why don't we count all the civilians who were killed, wounded, captured, missing, or died of their wounds? Don't you think we should be a little more even-handed in our count and I would suggest that this is done 
by early historians to dramatize the death of Jenny Wade. Which, again, I'm not against that. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's right, we're doing a disservice to John Burns. How could we do that? So, uh, so in other words, a statement would be something like, while 50,000 men died in the Battle of Gettysburg, Jenny Wade was the only civilian, you know? So it'd be something like that. I'm sure I can admit it sound more dramatic. So let's talk about the civilian casualties now. Okay, Mary Virginia Jenny Wade was 20 years old in 1863. She was killed on the morning of July 3rd when a stray bullet passed through the door of her house on Cemetery Hill and struck her while she is working at a dough tray in preparation for making bread or biscuits, depending on your account. She was originally buried next to the house she was killed at and then later a church in town and eventually she's moved to Evergreen Cemetery. Were there other civilians killed during the fighting? Depends who you talk to. For years, there have been rumors going around, and I say rumors, you know, um, let's say they're spread by, uh, uh, you know, storytellers or, um, uh, you know, early guides, but, or early historians, you know, depending on how you want to put it. And these stories are early on. Um, Colonel Sheeds, if you know who Colonel Sheeds was, he was a, a school teacher, uh, a licensed guide for a while, a uh, National Park Service ranger, famous for taking John F. Kennedy around the battlefield. He promoted a story that another girl in town was killed during the battle. And he lectured about it. It's in the, I know a lot about it because it's in the newspaper where he did a little um, uh, lecture about things in the battle you probably don't know. And he highlighted that story, got a lot of attention. But it's clear that Colonel Sheed's story came from the history of the 76th New York, because he mentions that several times. And I don't know about you guys, but when I was young, I had the history of the 76th New York you know, on my bedside, on my... Um, uh, we all do, right? Yeah. Yeah. And um, it's published in 1867. So the thing about this history was it was published so early after the battle that they really didn't know a lot. Not a lot of books had been published on the battle, and there weren't a lot of other histories to compare it to. But this is the story told in that history. The people of Gettysburg, like the bulk of the people of the free state, are heartily loyal. At many of the doors and windows, the ladies, lads, and girls stood through the long, hot day, July 1st, and passed water and food to the Union troops. The men of the 76 will not soon forget, and I should fail in the performance of my duty, did I not mention the nameless heroine who, with a cup in each hand, so busily dealt out water to the thirsty boys, their tears of sympathy streaming down their lovely cheeks, as the wounded soldiers came hobbling by until, pierced by a rebel ball, she fell dead by the side of her pail. We regret that we cannot hand down her name to posterity. Even in these humble pages, the memory of her deeds and her heroic sacrifice shall remain green, though her name is unknown. So again, this was published in 1867, and we know that the 76 New York was retreating up Baltimore Street. And we know that Jenny Wade was in front of her house handing out water. And I assume that they just heard later that she died and they think that it's Jenny Wade was killed while she's handing out water. That's my assumption. This is not a different girl in town. I find it very hard to believe with all the records we have that there could possibly be another civilian who was killed during the battle that we don't know about. I should also point out, oh, not that page, where did I put the other page? Oh, in a book entitled The Catawaba Soldiers, Catawaba, anybody from North Carolina? Catawaba Soldier in the Civil War, 
um, a guy named David Miller of Company F, 57th North Carolina, Isaac Avery's brigade, made the extraordinary claim that while charging the enemy through the streets of Gettysburg on July 1st, he saw a lady laying in the street with the top of her head shot off, her baby lying near, crying, a heart-rendering sight to him, even though he was charging the enemy. That's a little hard to believe. So you can find, like I said, there's two examples uh, where people say, oh yeah, another person was killed during the battle. But um, uh, I would say um, not really. Okay, died of their wounds. So we're not talking about killed in the battle, but we're talking about died as a result of the battle. Ephraim Whistler. And you know, I've uh, talked a lot about this over the years. I put him in my forms of Gettysburg book. I tried to give this guy attention. The account of his, um, uh, his account of his uh, uh, mortal wounding comes from a local school teacher named Aaron Shealy, who was the Adams County Superintendent of Schools in uh, 1863. And he was a tour guide, and he wrote a lot of stories of the battle. And I should mention, this is the only source for this story. And it was written in 1903, 40 years after the battle, and basically, he mentions that Ephraim Whistler lives on the Chambersburg Pike near the first shot marker. And after Marcellus Jones fired the first shot of the battle and the uh, vedettes rode away, the Confederates dropped a, an artillery piece in the road um, on the other side of Marsh Creek and began shelling uh, the spot where the, shell, where the first shot came from. And Ephraim Whistler ran out of his house and uh, maybe to motion or you know, yell to the Confederates to stop firing at his house. And um, he's a, uh, what, a 32-year-old blacksmith off the top of my head. I don't have his age here. But he runs out, waving his arms, an artillery shell lands near him. And according to um, Aaron Shealy, who wrote about it, he was paralyzed by shock or concussion thrown to the ground. According to Shealy, the shock to his nervous system was so great that he became totally prostrated. He took to his bed soon after and never rose from it. And of course, the records, um, his estate papers and his burial record, he's at Lower Marsh Creek Presbyterian Church Cemetery, indicate he died on August 15th, 1863. So this is about a month after the battle, a little more than a month, and he dies supposedly uh, of concussion that he received from the shell that exploded in front of his house. And again, um, I'm freely telling you, there's no other source for this story except this 1903 account by um, this uh, local. So take it for what it's worth. And then I wanted to mention that an unnamed dog was killed in the first day's battle. This is an account from William H. Byrd of Company C, 13th Alabama. And he mentions when Archer's Brigade goes in the line of battle and comes up and over, uh, apparently, her ridge. Part of his regiment comes upon a house, and the owner runs out and talks to him. And as they're going by the house, a dog comes out from under the porch and barks and chases, starts chasing the men and one of them shoots and kills the dog. So a civilian dog was killed during the battle. A civilian dog. Not even a mascot, it was a dog. A civilian. And, you know, I'm not gonna get into the number of cows that were obviously killed in the battle. You know. For food or by accident? <laughs> yeah, well, good question. Well, we know that the 124th New York at Devil's Den kills, slaughters some cattle. And Henry Hunt says an artillery shell explodes in a, 
uh, you know, a bunch of cattle that are in front of Little Round Top when he's riding to Smith's Battery. So we have a couple of counts of uh, cows being killed in the battle. And then Albertus McCreary uh, says that, you know, um, after the battle, they went out and their cow was gone and they thought it was killed. And a few days later, the cow comes down the, down the road and just wanders back to their house. But the cow has a bullet hole in its side and every time they milk it, you know, milk squirt out. So he's a wounded cow, but we're not going to talk about the cows here. Okay, let me tell you the story of Absalom Shedder of Chambersburg. Have you heard that um, Lee uh, spent the evening, uh, or spent a, did, I guess it would be, what day would that be? 29th, 28th, 27th, 28th, 29th in there at Me Messer Smith's Woods near Chambersburg? Or some people call it Shedder's. Woods. So we're talking about this, this event must have occurred near Chambersburg, near the Pizza Hut. Do you know where Pizza Hut is in Chambersburg? We'll say it's, it occurred near the Pizza Hut. Um, this is from uh, the Valley Spirit of Chambersburg on July 8th, 1863. Early Sunday morning last, Mr. Absalom Shedder residing a half a mile east of Chambersburg, committed suicide by hanging. The rebels had carried away all his stock and grain, and his mind became totally impaired. He was found hanging in the orchard whither he had wandered during the night. As soon as he was discovered, an inquest was summoned by Esquire Hammond, who returned a verdict of death by hanging. So in the newspaper, it says that this guy hung himself because the Confederates took all his property. Isn't that interesting? Okay. And then, of course, we have Edward McPherson Woods, who died on July 5th. And according to the account in the Gettysburg newspaper, quote, by discharge of a gun in the hands of his elder brother. He was just three years, seven months old. And some of you probably know about this guy. He's buried in the Gettysburg Methodist Church Cemetery on Middle Street, and you can go visit his grave on July 5th. So we can only imagine, you know, a family huddled in their basement for three days, you know, they finally let the kids out. The Confederates, on July 4th, the Southern Army was still on Seminary Ridge, firing into the western edge of the town. This family, I now know, lived on Chambersburg Street, what today would be 146 Chambersburg Street. There's a modern house there now. But it would be just down the street on the same side with uh, Gary Owen, Irish pub. If you want to know, if you want to know whereabouts, it took me a long time to place Alexander Woods, his father. He's a renter, but that's where I figure he lived. So they, you know, July fifth is the first opportunity the kids have to go outside, and a boy picks up a rifle and shoots and kills his three-year-old brother. It's hard not to count him as a death and a direct result of the battle. That's got to be, and you know, forget about whether we come as a death during the battle, that's got to be a casualty, wouldn't you think? Okay, you may not have heard of Samuel Waring of York, Pennsylvania, was killed on July 10th while engaged in the handling guns on the battlefield, is a quote from the newspaper. He was instantly killed by the accidental discharge of a gun while in the act of unloading them. So he's sent here to help clean up, and he's killed. Now that's, I know that's an accident, obviously, so that's an, that could be an accident. But it's an accident after the battle, a casualty. So on my list, they are casualties, obviously, you know. I gotta, I gotta get to 29 here. <laughs> you shoot it right but don't you want to see if you it's loaded first maybe you're looking into it 
I was just talking to somebody the other day, uh, a guy who was repairing an old house. And he said in the rafters, we're talking about artillery shells and buildings in the park, finding that artillery shell. And um, uh, he, there was something in the wall and he couldn't figure out what it was. And he was taking his hammer and he's beating on it to try to get it out of the wall. And it came out and it was an artillery, a live artillery shell. And he had been beating on it with his hammer. He was hilarious when he told the story. Um, yeah, it, it wouldn't have been hilarious if he hit it one more time. So then we have James M. Culp, who was killed by the explosion of the shell near Evergreen Cemetery in September 1863. And this, this is where you get into this common, this common thing. Local people are, you know, they don't have any money. Uh, the kids are going out and they're finding things on the battlefield and then they're selling stuff at the train station as visitors are coming into town and visitors want to buy souvenirs or relics from the battle. Preferably something really cool like a, you know, identified Confederate officer sword or something. But there's stuff to be had and there's money to be made. And the people here, uh, some of them are starving, their crops are destroyed, their farms are destroyed, they're not being reimbursed by the federal government. So they're gathering up stuff and selling them. Art artifacts. Well. The problem is, no one wants to buy a live artillery shell. <laughs> so the kids, what they're doing is they're unscrewing the fuse and dumping the powder out and then sewing the artillery shells. But as time went by, the brass fitting in the fuse that you unscrew, uh, you know, in the iron shell, it started to get a little rusted and corroded. So, you know, James Culp is banging an artillery shell against a rock to get the fuse out and it explodes and he's killed. And we have several accounts of it. Um, his father was Daniel Culp, who had a carpenter shop on Baltimore Street near the courthouse. And you know, it's his carpenter sh shop where the coffin for Jenny Wade was made. And this James M. Culp, his first cousin is Wesley Culp, who's you know, killed uh, in the fighting east of town during the battle. So, um, uh, He's buried in Evergreen Cemetery. He, he's got a more modern stone. They replaced his stone, but uh, you can see his grave today. Um, and it, it's, just, it's just a sad story. Alan Frazier is a 15-year-old boy who was living with Solomon Powers on High Street. And he was killed on November 20th, 1863 the day following Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, a man named Russell Briggs of Philadelphia was visiting town for the dedication of the Soldiers National Cemetery. His son, George Briggs, had served in the 72nd Pennsylvania Webb's Brigade at the Angle, was killed in the fighting, and is laid to rest in the Pennsylvania plot. So he's in town to visit and to hear Lincoln give the Gettysburg Address over his son's grave in the National Cemetery. And according to the account in our local newspaper, Mr. Briggs had just returned from the battlefield and having picked up a shell on the ground, stopped at the shop of Mr. Solomon Powers to open it. While thus engaged, apparently he's banging the stone against a rock, the shell exploded, killing young Frazier who was standing close by and mutilating Mr. Briggs in such a horrible manner as to make his recovery doubtful. Both his hands are blown off and his limbs otherwise fractured, while both eyes are thought to be entirely destroyed. He presents a horrible picture of misery. The lad who had his home with Mr. Powers was instantly killed, his body being almost torn to pieces. Here is another warning added to the many others since the battle. Will the people never become sensible to the dangers they incur by handling shells? We have boys and grown up men who still persist in the rash work of opening shells, not only at the risk of their own lives, but those of their neighbors. Against this, we enter a solemn protest and if they will not learn wisdom from the past, 
Let the provost marshal or our civil authorities at once put a stop to at least in the town as the town is concerned. No, not one more shell should be allowed to be open within the limits of the town. And, you know, um, there were some serious problems with these explosions and people being injured. I have some more injuries I, I, I probably should add to my list from the shells. I just thought of one I didn't put in my list. So I have 30. Okay. There's a young black girl in town killed on March 1st, 1864. We do not know her name. She's probably buried in, in 1864, um, the York Street uh, Colored Cemetery, but she never had a stone. And so, and the paper doesn't tell her name, and we don't have death records at that time, and we don't have the church records that had the burial records, so we don't know who it was. But it's in the newspaper. So here it is from the Gettysburg Star and Banner. A distressing accident occurred in this place on Monday last. Several boys, aged about 15, were amusing themselves with a piece of an old gun from the battlefield, shooting Mark, we believe, when the contents of one of the discharges entered the head of a little colored girl who was near the spot, inflicting a mortal wound to her head. She was about seven years of age. She died from the effects of the wound. The boy was placed under arrest, but the identity of the girl, oh, I don't have the, oh, the, the, the girl who, um, the identity of the boy who shot her, or the name of the girl was never disclosed in the paper of the day, and so we don't know. So I haven't been able to find any more record of it. And there, are, like I said, if you look around, there are similar um, uh, accidents, not fatal ones such as that. I'm reading the fatal ones. Frederick Eshelman, born in 1858. So let's see, he's five years old. His father, they lived in Fairfield. His father, Hiram Eshelman, had volunteered as a member of Company G, 209th Pennsylvania Infantry. It's a, all a Fairfield unit. The 209th was in heavy fighting at Petersburg, Virginia on April 2nd, 1865. Eshelman was discharged in May of 1865. While he was away from home, a tragic incident occurred that seriously impacted the Eshelman family. The events of January 17th 1865 were related by the Gettysburg Star and Banner. We are called upon to record another sad and fatal accident from the careless use of firearms. On Tuesday last week, two little boys, children of Hiram Eshelman of Fairfield, were playing with a barrel of a gun which they had picked up after the army had left this place. The children, it seems, were in a room, and while the elder of the two placed the breech of the barrel in the stove, he called upon his little brother to put his ear to the other end to hear something. When the gun discharged, the contents passed through the head of the boy and caused almost instant death. The young lad, what adds to the sadness of the affair is the fact that the father was absent in the army. We do not know when we've been called upon to record an accident so distressing. It is another sad warning against the dangers of handling shells. And this is a common theme in the paper. Please stop handling the shells. Stop making lamps out of them and selling them to tourists. <laughs> You know, but you know, it just went on and on. Okay, there's also a number I mentioned of deaths associated with uh, locals dying of disease due to the unhealthy conditions after the battle. 
And just, I wrote down three that I remember clearly here. Uh, Susanna Herbst, uh, John Herbst on the first day's battle, his wife died in the fall of 1863 of disease because of, um, they said, contaminated uh, water in their well from the battle. Um, John R. Warner, uh, who lived on York Street, he was a Presbyterian minister. His wife died in the fall of 1863, they say, as a result of the contamination from the battle. Um, Sally Myers talks about uh, her next door neighbor. Well, it's funny, I don't even, I wrote it down here, I, don't, I didn't write her name down here, I don't remember her name. But she was caring for wounded at the hospital, and according to Sally Myers' diary, she died of fatigue or something she caught from the soldiers she was caring from, caring for, and she mentioned that specifically. So I, you know, I think, um, uh, and uh, again, I mentioned Colonel Sheed's. A Colonel Sheed's st story was that one of Carrie Sheed's sisters died of, um, he would always say, um, chloroform overdose while caring for the wounded soldiers and helping a doctor with the wounded after the battle. Turns out, though, she died in Washington, D.C. in 1865. So if she did, it was in a hospital in Washington, D.C., and not right after the battle. Okay, let me, let me check her time. Up, oh, where's Audrey? Where is she at? We have to do our, our, our it's time for our, um, our raffle. Let me get to our raffle tickets. Hold on. Okay, who stole my ticket? I never win. Audrey had, Audrey's supposed to be pick, paying attention to this. Okay, she put the basket, this time we have the baskets in the ticket though, or the tickets in the basket, something like that. Okay, I'll try not to read them upside down this week. <clears throat> okay, last three numbers. Oh, you know what? I don't have anything to give away. Let me go get the stuff to give away. Did she leave them down here? at Audrey. I hold her personally responsible. <laughs> okay. Also, you know, it's funny, I threw the one down, I still have it. I, do, I remember the number though, don't worry. Seven, five, five. Maybe seven, five, five? It's not you guys? Oh, there you go. Very good. Thanks. It's all right. You can keep that. We trust you. You're the only one who put, you, put up your hand. When I read the number upside down, three people put, uh, held up their hand last week, right? <laughs> oh, you know, I see what's going on. The blue tickets, it's printed on the one side, and the red ones are printed on the other side. No wonder I'm confused. Okay. This is a blue one. That should help. Five, six, three. Oh, Veronica. Okay, one more, one more. And then we'll take our little break. And this is another red one. Let's see. Nine, six, six. Oh, there you go. Winner. Okay, so we'll take a five minute break. Talk amongst yourselves. If you're a lover of history, then go to trhistorical.com. There you'll find apparel, decor, and gear, and our listeners will receive 10% off plus free shipping within the U.S. if you use promo code GBERG1863 at checkout. So take advantage of this deal at trhistorical.com. TR Historical for the love of history. For the Historian has a wide variety of titles, new and used, of military books from publishers like Osprey, Gettysburg Publishing, Stackpole, Savas Beatty, UNC Press, and more. I make it a point to go there once a week because I have new bookshelves to fill and I never know what treasures I'll find, and neither will you. They even have toy soldiers, model kits, games, children's books, and more. So stop by and check them out on your next visit to Gettysburg, or better yet, order right now online at ForTheHistorian.com and mention that you heard about them on Addressing Gettysburg in the Note to Seller box, and they will refund you your shipping. 
And if you call 717-685-5207 or stop by the store on your next visit and mention us, you'll get 20% off retail price. That's ForTheHistorian.com or 717-685-5207. You've heard us promote various ways that you can help us keep the show going, but one way we haven't pushed too much is our sutlery at AddressingGettysburg.com slash shop. That's a shame because we have designs over there by talented artists like Ty DeWitt of 1863 Designs and Mike Stretch of the Heritage Depot. So now we're promoting it. Buying shirts, hoodies, mugs, and other items from our sutlery not only helps us keep the lights on, but it also helps guys like Ty and Mike, and it helps spread the word about the show every time you wear an item or you sip from your mug. So head over to addressinggettysburg.com slash shop and grab some merch. It's the perfect Christmas gift for the Gettys nerd in your family. That's addressinggettysburg.com slash shop. Hey, Gettysburg business owners. Winter is just around the bend, and you know what that means. No tourists. But just because people aren't coming to you doesn't mean you can't bring your business to them. If you ship, you're still in the game. And if you're a seasonal business, the time to advertise for your next season is in the off-season when people are making their plans. So what's an affordable yet highly effective way of reaching those people? It's not radio. It's not TV, and it's certainly not print. Step out of the Jurassic era of advertising and run an ad on Addressing Gettysburg. We just reached 1 million downloads, and we're growing by the tens of thousands every month. Beyond that, our audience is happy to support those who support their favorite podcast. So email sales at Addressing Gettysburg for more information about advertising on our show. We look forward to helping your business grow. That's sales at AddressingGettysburg.com. Okay. Okay. Let me get. I'll get him back now. Okay. Um, a couple of announcements I just wanted to make is that uh, uh, one that uh, you know everybody might know that our new museum Gettysburg Beyond the Battle is opening soon to the general public, and there are different preview nights that uh, people in the different uh, different people in the town are going to come and visit, um, and uh, like. Uh, you know, um, Addressing Gettysburg has a special preview uh, podcast uh, reception there March 18th. 18th, March 18th. So, you know, you could buy tickets to that if you want to uh, get a sneak preview uh, and see that. And um, uh, I know there were licensed battlefield guides and National Park Rangers and Gettysburg Foundation employees were there. Jim was there. Um, a couple weeks ago, and Jim kept telling me, this is my favorite part, and then he went to another part, this is my favorite part. <laughs> so I, I already knew he liked it a lot because he kept telling me that. But you know, I, I think it's, for me, it's, it's interesting for my friends to go and see it because I talk about it, you know, I talked about it a lot for like three years, and people are always ask, asking me like, what are you, what are you doing? What, you know, what, what is this you're doing? You know, so now they can see that I was actually doing something, you know. And then the other thing was that uh, we're not, we don't have the details uh, ironed out or anything like that, but I, I think they're gonna have um, Wednesday trivia night here at the oh, Farnsworth cool. House. So you know how they have trivia at different places around town, and I think they're just gonna try to get into like a Wednesday night niche where we'll have one of those people DJing or reading trivia. I don't know that it will be me, I don't know. <laughs> But, uh, and I definitely won't pick the trivia, but, uh, so, but they're going to have uh, something here. So keep an eye out uh, for that in our advertisements. Okay, I think I was on. What's that? Locals are welcome. Yes, locals are welcome to that. Yes. Of course, if you know, July 1st, 2nd, 3rd hits on a Wednesday, you know, there won't be any trivia night because we need the tourists. Yeah. I always think I, that's interesting about town. We're just talking about that in town and, you know, different places around town where that happens. Um, you know, and I've lived in the town for a long time. The thing that get, got me a little bit is that is the upgrade of the price of the drink from the winter to the, the spring, you know. I think the Farnsworth House is interesting in that respect. And I don't know how many people still have one, but the Farnsworth House, what they tried to do was to give the locals a pass. It's called the Tavern Pass. So that, now they don't have us anymore. I'm saying, oh, in, the old, in the old days, they would give you a pass, and then you came in the summer, you could show your pass, and oh, okay, you're, 
you're in the club. <laughs> like you, you, get, you get the winter price on your drink. I just find that, that whole, it is, it is an interesting dynamic living in a town where it's really busy and then it's really dead for a few months. You know, the tourist, the tourist town. Okay, so let's talk about wound, people who were wounded uh, in the battle. So who do we have? Of course we have John Lawrence Burns, who um, joined Union soldiers in line of battle and was wounded several times in the fighting west of the town on the afternoon of July 1st. He survived his wounds and survived the war and of course became a national celebrity. But did you know that on, well, during the retreat following the battle, John Burns' brother-in-law, a guy named Andrew Hagerman. His, John Burns' wife was Barbara Hagerman, and she was originally from Bonneville, but her brother, Andrew, lived in Hagerstown, and in the street fighting at Hagerstown. Possibly, we're not sure the date, there's some conflicting information. It could have been on the skirmish in the streets on July 6th, or it was a skirmish in the street on July 13th. Uh, Andrew Hagerman, possibly hearing about his more famous brother-in-law, ran out and joined the Union Army in the street fighting at Hagerstown and was shot and killed in the fighting. So, a little sidelight on um, John Burns' brother-in-law. And then, of course, you know, you might have heard we have a guy named Charles F. Weekly. He's a young man from Emmitsburg, Maryland, and apparently he came into the camp of the 12th Massachusetts Infantry the night before the battle. And uh, they would have been camped um, uh, near the Maryland... Uh, uh, Pennsylvania uh, border. They were actually camped not far from like um, the liquor store there on the old Emmitsburg Road. What liquors is that? Mountain Liquors. Okay, so he's, he, they're camped near there. And this guy from Emmitsburg comes up, um, uh, a, young, a young teenager, and he kind of joins in with the unit. And then on uh, July 1st, he marches with them to Gettysburg. And he joins in the ranks of Company A, 12th Massachusetts Infantry, and was wounded on the afternoon of July 1st, but survived the battle. I pulled his pension record at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. He re-enlisted, or he enlisted, later enlisted, in Company G, 13th Pennsylvania Cavalry. Weeks died at a camp near Petersburg, Virginia, of illness on November 23rd, 1864. She don't hear his name that much, but actually he's one of the more famous uh, people that you might hear about if you talk about civilians in the battle, Charles Weekly. And um, so one of the guys in the 12th Massachusetts insists that he was not a civilian fighting in the battle, that he actually joined the unit and was mustered into the company, so he fought as a soldier on July 1st. So I checked the company muster rolls for that unit at the National Archives, because if somebody was enlisted in the unit and signed into the unit officially, they would be added to the muster rolls, and he was not. John Burns is also not on the muster rolls of the 7th Wisconsin as the soldier state. So I just point this out because they are civilians in the battle. They're not officially with the army. You have to, you can just, the soldier can say that, but you have to be officially mustered in. Charles Greist. A lot of people haven't heard of Charles Greist, but it's an inter interesting story. He's 31 years old. He's a resident of York Springs. On June 30th, a courier arrived in York Springs with a dispatch from Governor Curtin to General George Gordon Meade. Upon learning that the Confederates were near, 
The courier refused to take the message any further than York Springs. Realizing the importance of the delivering the dispatches, Greist volunteered to take them further. He found his way around and through Confederate forces and arrived near Gettysburg on the afternoon of June 30th. According to the account, he came to Colonel, um, Colonel, um, what's his name, Kellogg? I'm sure I have it written down here somewhere. The Colonel of the 17th Pennsylvania Cavalry and delivered the message. He was referred to General John Buford and remained with Buford's division as a volunteer courier and potential guide for the division. The next morning on July 1st, while carrying a dispatch to the 17th Pennsylvania Cavalry from um, Buford's headquarters, his horse was shot from under him, seriously injuring his left leg and ankle. He then apparently rode all the way to Newchester through the lines, stopped at a house in Newchester, and was cared for. And um, I, at the Historical Society, we have actual letters that were part of a, a pension record where he tried to get money from the federal government for his service. I don't think he did. After the Confederate capture of the field, um, he rode, afterwards he rode to his home in York Springs. Grist's horse, Lou, who was wounded, survived the war and was still alive in 1888 when he attended the ceremony surrounding the 25th anniversary of the battle. And his horse was kind of a celebrity there. Um, oh, I do say here that in 1890, Grist was awarded a pension for his services. Hmm. Okay, so I was wrong. He did get the pension. And a lot of these pensions, years and years and years ago, I pulled at the National Archives to see what kind of information there were. An example of that would be a story I found about Lizzie Waltz. Lizzie Waltz was wounded in the fighting at Hanover, Pennsylvania on June 30th, 1863. In 1899, an act was passed by Congress directing that her name be placed on the pension rolls. According to the account, she, quote, was wounded on the first day of the Battle of Gettysburg during a skirmish near Hanover, Pennsylvania, while giving food and administering to the wants of the Union soldiers. So she was out in the streets of Hanover and got wounded in the Battle of Hanover. And again, never hear about her name, Lizzie Waltz. Um, and according to, uh, oh, what I also discovered when I pulled the pension record is she was already collecting a widow's pension because her husband, Levi Wal um, Waltz, had served in the United States Infantry. So her husband was in the Army and she was getting a pension, and this act just kind of upgraded the pension. Then there's Amos Whetstone, uh, a student of the Lutheran Theological Seminary, he was boarding with the Weikert family, one of the many Weikerts, on Chambersburg Street at the time of the battle. And I guess they lived in a house that sits like um, near the Elephant Walk. You ever go there? The Thai restaurant no longer stands. And uh, according, uh, according to Mary McAllister, uh, on, who lived nearby, I went over to old Mr. Mrs. Weikert's on July 4th and on her back porch, there was a man. He said, take care, you will be shot. Oh, I believe I am shot. He looked down, and a bullet had just gone through the fleshy part of his leg. On July 4th, the Southern Army occupied Seminary Ridge and the area out in front of Seminary Ridge. There's a great account on um, uh, the Fair Middle Street, how they're in the stream out there, the Confederates in the stream, firing into the streets of the town. So if you imagine, you know there's a little stream that runs under the West Street Shopping Center out there? Um, they're in the stream bed, firing into the town. Remember that John Burns on July 4th believes that he's, the Confederates are trying to assassinate him in his house because he fought in the battle and bullets are flying through the house? Well, he's in the middle of a skirmish and all the civilians at the western edge of the town are fearing for their lives at that time. Georgiana Stauffer lived on Baltimore Street 
and she was a renter, a tenant, so we're not sure exactly where she lived, but she lived somewhere in here. Um, she lived with her two children at the time of the battle. An eyewitness saw Mrs. Stauffer sink to the ground after being shot in the hip during the second day of the battle as she was about to carry water to the men of um, one of the companies out there. The incident is said to have occurred near the home of Henry Garlack, who just lives right up the street here, in the area of heavy skirmishing on July 2nd. Her husband, Jacob, was a member of Company K, 1st Pennsylvania Reserves, and was present at Gettysburg. That he must have visited his wife and family immediately following the battle is illustrated by the fact that Georgia gave birth on April 5th, 1864. Now, do you know that the commander of Company K on the evening of July 3rd told everybody that they could go home? But they had to come back the next morning, and then he marched away. So that local company went home and visited their family. Captain Henry Minning himself went and visited his family on Middle Street. So let's get this story straight. Jacob Stauffer leaves his company, visits his wife, who's been wounded in the hip from the battle. I was like, that, I'm sorry you're wounded, but you know, I, have, I don't have much time here. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of how the scenario played out there. So she gave birth on April 5th, 1864. You can do the math. Jacob returned to his unit, was captured in the Mine Run Campaign in November of 1863, and subsequently died in Andersonville Prison. He died on February 1st, 1865. Isn't that, isn't that kind of strange? Um, I don't know if, um, should I count that as a battle baby? On my battle babies list? I didn't, when I did the battle, battle babies, that wasn't part of it. Okay. Robert F. McElhenney operated a dry goods store out of the Wills house at the time of the battle. I, I still don't exactly understand how this worked or where it was. But clearly, he's got a claims file. And clearly, his store is in the Wills house, not the the house beside it. And then we know by November of 1863 there's no store in that building because, you know, the presidential dignitaries and, the, you know, they're going through the building for that reception. There's no mention of a store then. But um, according to the Adams Sentinel, he was wounded in the leg and he is recovering. And I don't have any other information about how he was wounded. Jacob Gilbert of Chambersburg Street was wounded, all, was wounded in the skirmishing at the edge of the town on July 4th. And you might know that Jacob Gilbert, his wife Elizabeth, wrote an account, and he is part of one of the families that ended up in the basement of the Troxel House with Sarah Broadhead. According to his wife Elizabeth, that day, quote, was one of the most dangerous to the people at the western edge of the town. The Union sharpshooters had the high buildings of the town to cover the Confederate retreat, while sharpshooters of the latter from Seminary Ridge were replying with a sharp fire into the town. So I know a lot of times we think about the battle being over on July 4th, but there was this violent sharpshooter action at the northern and western edge of the town all day long. And then, uh, let's see, quote, on this day, uh, this is somebody's interviewing Elizabeth, her husband Jacob Gilbert had gone up to Middle Street and while in front of the Waddles home, which is in the first block of Middle Street, was struck on the left arm by a Confederate bullet making a flesh wound in the upper arm. He went by way of alleys and yards to Dr. Horner's on Chambersburg Street and the wound was attended to, then he went home. And um, that's fascinating. He's also uh, listed on, um, as being wounded in the Adams Sentinel on July 9th, 1863. So we know he was wounded. Later, 
Jacob will join the band of the Iron Brigade and actually serve in the Union Army. Frederick Lehman was a student of Gettysburg College. Like John Burns, he is said to have journeyed onto the field and have participated in the battle on July 1st. He was captured in the fighting, but eventually released or escaped the Confederates. And on July 4th, he emerged from a house on Chambersburg Street to check out the progress of the battle and was wounded in the leg. And here's something interesting. I, I, this is something new I've never talked about. I found this recently. Solomon Powers, who had the really pretty girls on um, <laughs> High Street. Boy, everybody seems to know that. Um, he was wounded, apparently, on the evening of July 1st. According to an article in the Sunbury Gazette, you know, a recent newspaper they, they put on, you know, newspapers.com, you can look at digitally. Um, according to Sunbury Gazette of July 28, 1866, so three years after the battle. The citizens of Gettysburg never tire of speaking to strangers about the great fight and tell many interest, interesting and, um, oh, I'm sorry, many incidents of the interesting nature. We met an old gentleman who had immigrated to Gettysburg from New Hampshire 24 years ago. Gotta be Solomon Powers. He's from New Hampshire. He had been on the ground in the evening of the first day's fight, assisting the wounded in front of his house, and in doing so, was hit twice himself. So that's one I never, I never had any account of that. So either he's just lying a little bit, or, or, or you know, it's another wounded citizen. T. Duncan Carson was a cashier at the Bank of Gettysburg and a resident of York Street at the time of the battle. And following the battle, he is also reported by the Adam Sentinel in the newspaper as being slightly wounded in the arm. So he's definitely a wounded citizen. Need a core badge or other and insignia then, for a uniform? Here's one you check you out not the badge of. maker. Here's what some of his John satisfied Michael customers had Minig. to say. Miranda said, I ordered an identification disc from Joe Minig, and it's fantastic. The of he hand stamped it exactly as I want. Greg said, my unit has purchased from him battle. in the past quality and badges and good service. On, um, and Jerry S. says, the badge uh, maker is you know, the go-to place for accurate round top. replica Civil War badges. So go to civilwarcorebadges.com and, and attach uh, a message with your order saying you heard about them But according to the Red General History, on the evening of July 3rd, they were camped on a little round top, and actually, they mentioned their camp where the dance pavilion now is. So we're talking about the amusement park on the back side of a little round top. And it's one of the things I always think about when I walk down on the back side of the round top near the, where I think the dance pavilion was. But according to the account, he was wounded on July 2nd or July 3rd, probably July 3rd, while taking food out to his brother, the commander of Company K. Now, this story, granted, comes from the Minig family. And I've been searching for a really good, a better source for this. <laughs> I've even asked some of the people in the family. But my source for this story is a Minig family genealogist telling this to the Gettysburg Round Table in 1969, and then the Gettysburg Times recording it in the newspaper. This is, that's not a very good source. <laughs> And no one in the family seems to know where this guy came with this story. But the story is that um, Henry's family had learned of Company K's arrival near Gettysburg. They sent John Minig to take food to him. Confederates fired on the youth near Little Round Top, and a bullet hit a rock near him. A piece of the rock struck him in the eye and fell to the ground. Captain Minig, seeing a man fall, sent some members of Company K to rescue him. When he brought the youth back to Company K, he found that it was his own brother. John was blinded in the eye by that piece of rock. So in the rest of life, this guy was blind in one eye. So I can't, that's the, that's the only source I have for that. Okay, so now I want to talk about prisoners of war. 
And you know, I think there's a tendency to downplay the men that are captured at the battle as not being real casualties. But you know, at that time, if you're captured and you're taken to prison camp, what happens to you in prison camp? You starve and you die. So a lot, I mean, this is one of the reasons why people downplay the fighting by the 11th Army Corps in the streets because so many of them are captured. And this is also one of the reasons why the 154th New York on their monument out there has a statistic. Um, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it says 45 of the members died while in prison who were captured in the battle. I don't know which, does that sound right, Jim? Yeah, Some, Something like that. But, you know, people like to downplay the captured as not being true casualties. But besides taking prisoners from the armies during the battle, the Southern Army also took local residents prisoners. And there's a variety of reasons. I should mention that in Jeb, in 1862, um, Jeb Store took prisoners. And it was really part of a much larger dispute between the United States and the Confederate States authorities. In retaliation for the actions of General John Pope and the Union Army in Virginia during the summer of 1862, Robert E. Lee ordered Jeb Stuart, this is part of Jeb Stuart's orders when he comes north in 62, quote, should you meet with citizens of Pennsylvania holding state or government offices, it will be desirable, if convenient, to bring them with you that we may, they may be used as hostages or means of exchange for our citizens that have been carried off by the enemy. So Lee is ordering Stuart to capture postmasters, Justice of Peace, anybody has a commission, um, you know, from, uh, you know, the state or the federal government. Postmasters end up being the people that targeted most. And I think what happened was John Pope got this idea in August of 1862, hey, we're in Northern Virginia, go arrest any postmasters that were commissioned by the Confederate States of America. They're traitors and they're government officials and we'll put them in jail. And he arrested all these poor little postmasters. So this is done in, re so our postmasters are taken prisoner in retaliation. And in 62, there's a bunch of guys taken from Franklin County, and there's like seven guys I know of that are taken uh, from Adams County during his raid. And we have some interesting accounts of it. Um, let's see, we have a, an account by, um, let's see, who is it? It's John Paxton, I believe, in an 1890 letter. I was captured by General Jeb Stuart on his raid through our state and town and was held hostage and spent the winter of 62-63 in Libby. And then um, he, his health was shattered by it. Okay, well, I'm not going to talk about the 62 guys, though. So in 1863, when a Confederate army invades, more citizens are taken. Probably one of the more famous ones is George Kadori. Oh, a Kadori. Cindy, you know, Cindy's a Kadori over there. So George Kadori lived in Gettysburg on Middle Street. And um, he was one of the Kadori brothers, Nicholas, that owns a farm out there, lives on New York streets, his brother, um, that had moved here earlier, you know, from the area of. Um, France that is now part of Germany or back in the area that goes back and forth between Germany and France, right? According to the account, and one of the things that I really was excited about, one of my friends at the National Archives was doing research on prisoners of war, and they alerted to me, they alerted me that the records of Castle Thunder have interviews with Gettysburg citizens in them about why they were captured. And I was able to look at these prisoner of war records and they gave a list of the Gettysburg citizens who were captured and why they were taken prisoner, which I just thought was crazy. It said he had been on a visit to Emmitsburg, Maryland. And on July 2nd, and you know, I should mention George Kadori was associated with um, the, uh, what's it, uh, Mother Seton um, nunnery there. He's Catholic. 
he goes to the Gettysburg Catholic Church and he has some association with that um, Catholic Church. So he's returning from Emmitsburg on July 2nd, was on his way home when he unexpectedly passed into the Confederate lines. Suspected of being a spy, he was taken south where he spent 20 months in Libby Prison and Castle Thunder. 20 months. Released from captivity in March 1865, he contracted pneumonia on the journey home. He arrived in Gettysburg and died a week later after returning to his wife and family. And his house still stands on, on uh, West Middle Street. If you make it up there, it's a, it's a house painted white. Don't know the address off the top of my head. Probably have it in here somewhere. Just a sad story. And he's buried in the Gettysburg uh, Catholic Cemetery. Okay. James Crawford Gwynn was taken under suspicion of being a spy when he inadvertently crossed into the Confederate lines. He was taken south, held in Libby Prison in Castle Thunder until his release in March 1865. <clears throat> According to the Castle Thunder records, he was taken by Confederate pickets near Gettysburg for passing their lines. Says he did not know and did it without intending. So we got citizens that are wandering down the road and you know the Confederate pickets are hiding on the side of the road, jump out, what are you doing? Uh, I don't know. And they take him prisoner and you know, I guess they're thinking that these citizens are coming into the lines to gather information and they're gonna sneak back out and give it to the Union Army. Um, according to a letter by his wife, uh, it's really sad. She wrote a letter to Congressman Edward McPherson in October 1863 and tried to get his release, but she couldn't. It's, it's almost four months since Crawford was taken off by the rebels, and I see nothing of an exchange in the papers. Is there anything that you can do to have him released? And it, it just seems unfair that they're just holding these citizen hostages. Okay, I could read the whole letter. It gets sadder and sadder. But he survives. Emanuel Trosel lives on the Emmitsburg Road. A lot of these people live on the Emmitsburg Road. He was taken prisoner on July 2nd near his home on the Emmitsburg Road. If I remember correctly, of course, I did this research a long time ago. He lives in, if you get on the Emmitsburg Road, do you know where the Bowen Alley is? The next house. Right on Ridge Road, the White House that's associated with the campground, I think he lives in that house. He expected to, he expected, quote, to be paroled, but the firing opened before the parole could be made. He was taken to Stanton, Virginia, walking the entire distance of 175 miles, was on the road six days, and for three days had not a mouthful to eat. He was detained in Richmond Prison, Libby Prison, Castle Thunder, Hell's Delight, and later Salisbury, North Carolina. In all, 22 months. He had been reported killed, but his wife always held hope of seeing him again. Isn't that nice? And he did return. Um, according to the Castle Thunder records, he was taken near his home. The Confederate picket line had been advanced um, and the prisoner did not know he was in it. He crossed the lines and was taken prisoner. Alexander Harper was the postmaster of Greenmount. Do you know where Greenmount is on the Emmitsburg Road? Down near the Eisenhower Inn. A little group of houses right at the entrance of the Eisenhower Inn. Or the All-Star Sports Pavilion. He was taken prisoner along the road a half a mile from his home after wandering into the Confederate picket line. He was taken south and held in various prisons until 1865. According to Castle Thunder, he was taken within a half a mile of his house, and he says he did not know he was wandering into their lines. Another guy near Greenmount was William Harper. He fled his house while the fighting was progressing and was returning to his house, 
because he thought the fighting was over. He was arrested by the Confederate pickets under suspicion of being a spy, and he was taken and held in the various prisons. George Arndt of Cumberland Township crossed the Confederate picket line and was taken prisoner, most, uh, again, most likely under suspicion of being a spy, and he also was taken south with the same group of prisoners. George Patterson was taken prisoner on July 2nd along with his nephew, Samuel Pitzer, near Pitcher Schoolhouse in Cumberland Township, if you know where Pitcher Schoolhouse was, at the intersection of uh, Black Horse Tavern Road and Pumping Station Road near uh, the Eisenhower Farm. He told the rebels he was on his way to his sister's house to remove her to a place of great sa greater safety. He was taken south and held in various prisons, including Libby Prison, Castle Thunder, and wasn't released until 1865. Um, let's see. Samuel Pitcher was his nephew, and Samuel Pitcher's farm is like right there at Pitcher Schoolhouse. It's called Pitcher Schoolhouse because it's on the Samuel Pitcher farm. Um, oh, this is the son. I'm sorry. This is 15 year old Samuel Pitcher, who's the son of Samuel Pitcher, who lives right there. He was taken prisoner along with his uncle, um, not far from his home. Uh, he was taken south and held in various prisons, and eventually, you know, I'm amazed that some of these guys were moved to Salisbury Prison in North Carolina. He returned home on March 15, 1865, his, quote, full term in prison being 20 months and 13 days. Samuel would never forget his experience, and he left an account of it. Sometimes we did not get anything to eat for two or three days, and the boys would eat anything they could lay their hands on. They ate rats, cats, and dogs. I had to throw some more dogs in there. And, um, you know, uh, there's a good story. Let me see. I don't, did I write down where I got this story from? It's from um, uh, an account from 1938 where a local was talking about some of the civilians. A family by the name of Pitcher had just silver under the board in the attic and went to the home of George Patterson six miles from Gettysburg. Let's see. Oh, they hid their silver under the attic and they went to George Patterson's house to stand in there. You probably know Emanuel Pitchers had died and his family hid the silver and gold in a bag under a bake oven and the Confederates took it. So that's what she's talking about. Worried about the safety of the articles, the women persuaded their brother, Samuel Pitcher and George, to go see about it. So according to their account, they are wandering through the Confederate lines to see if the silver and gold that they hid in the bake oven is still there. They would be disappointed because the silver and gold was stolen by the Southern Army some $3,000. Unknowingly, they got beyond the rebel lines and were taken prisoner and were taken south. Mr. Patterson did not return home until two years after the battle. During his absence, his wife died from grief over the uncertainty of his fate. So you know I had to check that out. George Patterson had married Julianne Pitzer, the daughter of Emanuel Pitzer, on October 25th, 1849. Julian. Julianne, maybe, died on August 21st, August 31st, 1863. So there you go. Does that count as a casualty? Okay. Her husband, don't worry though, her husband remarried her sister, Catherine Elizabeth Pitzer, <laughs> on August 24th, 1865. Remember that. You can always mar marry another sister if they, if they have enough. You know, I, I'm amazed at how common that was at that time, where your husband dies, you marry his brother, the wife dies, you marry his sister. Cornelius Hudelin of Mount Pleasant Township was taken prisoner by Confederate vedettes in the fighting on East Calvary Field under suspicion of being a spy. Several days later, however, he was able to persuade a Confederate officer to release him by flashing the Masonic sign. 
I don't know if I like that. I wonder if Wayne's here, using the Masonic sign to get yourself out of being taken prisoner. Okay, like Armistead at the angle flashing the Masonic sign. I just think that's kind of interesting. And then I have one last um, uh, prisoner that I think should go on our list, but um, I don't think anybody's ever put him on one of these lists because it's Henry J. Staley, the editor of the Gettysburg Compiler. Do you know Henry J. Staley was arrested by the provost marshal of the Union Army after the battle for being a traitor and spent weeks in Fort McHenry in prison. And it was all because David McConaughey decided to you know, exercise a little political revenge on his political opponent by telling, by having people testify that this um, newspaper editor of the Democratic newspaper, and Dave McConaughey is a Republican, was pointing out the locations of where families were hiding wounded northern soldiers during the battle. And so they arrested him, and they were waiting for the charges to be specified. In point of fact, Henry Staley had in his house the colonel of the 19th Indiana and had gone out and got a doctor to help amputate this guy's legs and save this guy's life. So it was a really, really nasty thing uh, and a nasty time to do this in time of war to call your neighbor a traitor and have him arrested. But uh, he spent time in prison, so we put him on the list as one of the prisoners. So. Depending on how you count, I had uh, 29 people there, not counting the 1862 prisoners or the dog or um, you know, the cow or some of the, or the people, or the people I know that died of disease. At the, I didn't count uh, Julianne uh, Pitzer Patterson either as being one of the civilian casualties. So there you go. Now you can tell your friends, next time they ask, uh, how many civilians were casualties of the battle? You can say 30. And that's, that's a larger, you know, I, I think if I just tell people that without explaining it, they would be like, no, nah, that's, that's way too many. Sometimes I do get to question, though, was there any other civilians killed during the war besides, um, you know, Jenny Wade? And, you know, it's only, it's interesting that we highlight that in such a way at the Battle of Gettysburg, but obviously in the entire Civil War, there were lots of civilians that were affected by the war. And if you want a simple answer to that question, did you ever watch the movie Blue and Gray? At the first battle of Bull Run, Mrs. Henry on Henry House Hill is in her bed, and artillery shell hits the house, and she and her bed go flying out the window. <laughs> Have you ever seen that? And she's killed in the fighting at first Bull Run. That's a true story. She is killed there in that fighting. Well, thanks for coming to my program and attending the last program of the year. And uh, you know, keep looking at our website because you might run some you know special programs up at the camp this summer if we if we have the opportunity. And there's always something happening that you can check out on the Addressing Gettysburg podcast. So thank you. Thank you.